Madam Speaker, the British people are rightly proud of their armed forces. This review will fundamentally reshape and modernise Britain's armed forces, sorting the weaknesses and building on our strengths and providing a structure to deal with tomorrow's threats and not yesterday's enemies. As a result, our forces will be more mobile, better manned, better supported and equipped and better able to act as a force for good. Ever since the government announced the Strategic Defence Review last year, we've all been keeping a careful eye on things, haven't we? Well, now it's finished. Now we can all see how it affects the army as a whole, how it changes the way the army works and what it does, and what the outcome will be for each of us as individual soldiers. In this Army Video Diary special report, we're going to take a good long look at SDR. We'll hear from the Assistant Chief of the General Staff, Major General Mike Wilcox, and we'll get a top-line summary from the Chief of the General Staff himself, General Sir Roger Wheeler. The simple truth is that SDR is good news for the Army. You should have all been briefed by now, and this special report from the Army Video Diary aims to confirm everything you've heard, and perhaps add a little more detail. There's a lot to do, and as plans develop, We'll bring you more up-to-date information in future Army Video Diaries. As we all know, today's army is very different from the one of just a few years ago. So are the threats we have to face and the tasks we have to undertake, which was the main driving force behind SDR in the first place. The first thing we'll look at is what demands SDR makes of the army. After that, we'll find out how we're going to meet them. The size and structure of the army is important to all of us, so we'll be talking about the changes in these areas. But first, here's the Assistant Chief of the General Staff, Major General Mike Wilcox, to tell us why the Army strongly supported the Strategic Defence Review and seized upon the opportunities it presented. So, we're being told that SDR is good for the Army. Exactly why is it good? Well, if you look at the Army of today, it's never been smaller in its history, and yet it's never been busier. On any one day, some 30% of the Army is committed to operations, and we're very undermanned. Now, under those circumstances, uh, you need uh, an army that's structured to enable you to deploy and meet a wide range of challenges across a whole spectrum of operations. And frankly, we haven't got it. So improving the structures is what you're after. Um, exactly what's wrong with how things have been running? Well, if you look at it, um, it's really a legacy uh, from the end of the Cold War and the review that ended that. Now, we couldn't know then quite how the world was going to change. But there are some things that we were left with. For instance, the fact that we rely enormously on carterization, particularly in our logistic area, which means rely on calling out reserves to produce some capabilities we need for very low-level operations. Now, we haven't got the structure or the mechanism that allowed us to do that. The second thing is we're unbalanced. We have uh, created a joint uh, de rapid deployment force which in effect stops us using one of our brigades, 5 Airborne Brigade, uh, for anything else other than a specific operation for that deployment force. So what does this mean when we look at the effect on jobs done by regular personnel or indeed, like myself, the TA? Well, let me start with the regular. In the case of, of the regulars, the problem is over commitment. And at the moment, even if a unit is worn for operations, when it comes back, because other units need to be brought up to operational establishments. We can't call out the TA to do that at short notice. We find that people are having to backfill other units. And as a result, they're going on operations very much quicker and earlier than they would do normally. It's overstretch. It will help sort out. In the case of the TA, what we need is a usable TA. The TA we've got is structured largely still as a result of the Cold War, where a large proportion of it in the combat arms was designed to defend the territory of this country against an invasion. Well, that's all gone and all changed. The warning time for something like that now stretches over 10 years. What we need for the TA is to make it usable, make it relevant for current circumstances. And that means integrating the, the regulars and the TA in, into an absolute whole. You're talking about the structures and the necessary changes to structures, and we'll see more about that in a few moments. But to what extent have the people involved um, actually been taken into account in this? Well, the people are fundamental. I mean, it's no good having a hugely well-equipped, well-stocked 
army if you haven't got the right people trained to the right degree, motivated and thoroughly behind you. So people were fundamental from the start. Now one of the problems we face in today's army is chronic undermanning. And that's the cause of a great deal of our problems. And it's a top priority for the army board to put that right. But you can't put that right if the structures are against you. And the structures still mean that when you come out of one operational tour, within about six months, you're sent back on another one because we haven't got the right mechanism to avoid that sort of thing. So when I say the structures, it's aimed at taking the overcommitment off the individual because the people are fundamental to us. So what sort of demands will SDR make on us? Well, for the Army, the most important demand of SDR is that it places even more emphasis on high readiness and power projection, and also requires that we can carry out different tasks simultaneously. As well as meeting its permanent commitments in mainland UK, Northern Ireland, Cyprus and elsewhere, SDR has some other clearly defined requirements for the Army. We must be capable of maintaining a brigade deployed indefinitely on a peacekeeping task, such as Bosnia. We must be capable at the same time of deploying a high readiness brigade capable of the full spectrum of operations up to and including war fighting as part of the Joint Rapid Reaction Force, which is a development of the Joint Rapid Deployment Force. Or we must be capable of deploying in 90 days a war fighting division of three square brigades. This would not be concurrent with either of the brigade deployments already mentioned. At the moment, the Army cannot meet these readiness and concurrency requirements. SDR demands that the Joint Rapid Reaction Force can deploy first echelon forces rapidly and at very short notice. The land forces for the JRF could be drawn from the Spearhead Battalion Group, the Lead Para Battalion Group or Armoured Recce, Aviation, Armoured or Armoured Infantry Battle Groups, along with groups from Combat Support and Combat Service Support, depending upon the threat. The second echelon forces, in essence the balance of the brigade, which provided the lead battle group, must be ready to follow with more substantial capabilities as necessary. We may have to take heavy equipment long distances to lightly deployment areas, so there are plans to acquire four more roll-on roll-off ships and four C-17 heavy lift aircraft. The third demand of SDR is that Britain continues its role as the lead nation in the ARC, which depends upon the UK's skills and resources. That means that, as well as providing the framework of the core HQ, its communications and key core troops, the UK will continue to commit an armoured and mechanised division. That, in a nutshell, is what the government's strategic defence review is asking of us. Yes, that's the question, but what's the plan? Well, as we heard from General Wilcox, the first thing we have to do is to make sure we have a structure which can meet the testing demands of SDR. The present five brigade structure, with three in Germany and two in the UK, can't provide the cycle of training and readiness to meet the new requirements. So, a key outcome of SDR is the formation of a sixth deployable warfighting brigade, a third mechanised brigade within three UK divisions. With this new structure, the Army can implement a formation readiness cycle, with brigades spending a year in phases of annual training, at high readiness and available for operations at short notice, and on peacekeeping tasks such as Bosnia. As they move through the cycle, the role and readiness of the brigades will change. At any one time, we will have an armoured and a mechanised brigade carrying out their primary warfighting training. Either an armoured or a mechanised brigade at high readiness and able to deploy at short notice for operations up to and including warfighting. And two brigades meeting a prolonged non-warfighting commitment with brigades deploying for six months each. Alternatively, we could deploy a division of three square brigades with a choice of capabilities at graduated readiness. In peace, one UK armoured division will be made up of an armoured recce regiment and three brigades, each of which has one armoured regiment and two armoured infantry battalions. Three UK divisions, three brigades will each have one armoured regiment, one armoured recce regiment, one armoured infantry battalion and two Saxon battalions. Each division could reinforce the other for a divisional size operation to make a deployed division of three square brigades. To achieve this new structure, the Army needs a 6th Brigade. But where's it going to come from? Here's the answer. 
The two enrol airborne battalions from 5 Airborne Brigade, together with some airborne combat support and combat service support elements, along with two aviation regiments, will form 16 Air Assault Brigade. An option to include a third non-para infantry battalion in this new brigade is being studied. When the Apache attack helicopter arrives, there will be three attack helicopter regiments in this brigade. 16 Air Assault Brigade will maintain the utility but increase the potency of our airborne forces. Meanwhile, the balance of 5 Airborne Brigade will be combined with other combat and combat support elements to form the 3rd Mechanised Brigade in 3 Div. This will be called 12 Mechanised Brigade. But what will it mean to you and your unit and me and mine? If you're in the Royal Armoured Corps, the news is that although the number of armoured regiments is being reduced from 8 to 6, they'll be far more combat capable. Each will have a strength of 58 Challenger 2s in four squadrons, so the RSC's total number of tanks isn't changing at all. A new management technique called whole fleet management means that the average holdings of MBTs for each regiment may be 30 at low readiness, but the full 58 on deployment. Whole fleet management means that there will be less time spent in the tank park doing maintenance and more time training. Three armoured regiments will be based in the UK and three in Germany. This means three of the six armoured regiments currently in Germany will come home over the next few years. So what will happen to these three regiments? One of these armoured regiments will convert to a recce role so that we have a fourth recce regiment. One armoured regiment is moving into nuclear, biological and chemical defence as part of a new joint army RAF unit. And the third will remain as an armoured regiment, relocated in the UK and belonging to the new 12 Mechanised Brigade. So what about the infantry? Well, we're keeping all the infantry battalions we have now, but with some changes of role to enhance their capabilities. Well, the armoured infantry battalions will go up from 8 to 9 in order to give the new 12 Mechanised Brigade its own warrior battalion. Similarly, instead of four Mechanised Battalions, there will now be six. The two enrolled para battalions from 5 Brigade will move into the new Air Assault Brigade. And two further battalions will move to form the new 12 Mech Brigade. The AMFL will no longer have a dedicated infantry battalion. Instead, the infantry battle group will be drawn from the pool of JRRF, although we will continue to provide the force troops as we do now. There will be no changes in Northern Ireland, Cyprus, Brunei and public duties. Nor any cut in the number of regular infantry battalions. There are no changes in the organisation of army aviation until the Apache enters service. This starts to happen towards the end of the year 2000. Once Apache arrives, we'll have three attack helicopter regiments in the Air Assault Brigade, one Lynx regiment in support of one and three divisions and a regiment in Northern Ireland. There'll be a new joint helicopter command within land with peacetime responsibility for admin and the training of helicopters that support the land battle. These are the helicopters used by the new Air Assault Brigade, the RAF's fleet of support helicopters and the Royal Navy's commando helicopters. So far, we've only talked about the combat arms, but there's a lot happening in combat support too. One light gun regiment will become an AS-90 regiment to support the new 12 Mechanised Brigade. A sixth Royal Engineer Close Support Regiment will be formed to support the newly created 12 Brigade. Another regiment will be formed to support the new Air Assault Brigade. Two Royal Engineer Air Support Squadrons will be formed to support the RAF. There are also some changes for the Royal Signals. The signal squadrons from 5 Airborne and 24 Brigade will take on new roles. There will also be enhancements to provide higher readiness communications support to the Joint Force HQ. There will be two additional air support squadrons to work with the support helicopter force. Two new combat support service group signal squadrons will be formed. The signal squadrons in armoured and mechanised brigades will also be upgraded. I think everyone in the army knows that the most overstretched part of our organisation is combat service support, with some of the army's most heavily committed troops. SDR has addressed this problem. 
The key changes in the logistics support orbit will be additional RLC squadrons within existing units, a new ambulance regiment and additional specialist troops such as Petroleum, Water, Postal Career and Provo. We are also creating a second line of communications to ensure that we can handle the simultaneous brigade operations which we talked about earlier. All these enhancements will lead to an extra 3,300 regular troops for the Army, mostly in the logistic, communications and medical units. Now for those of us in the TA. I'm sure we've all been concerned about our future with the stories that started appearing a few months ago, but here are the facts as they stand. As General Wilcox mentioned, despite two reviews since the end of the Cold War, a large proportion of the TA is still tasked for the defence of the UK mainland. However, nobody now believes that there is any immediate threat to our territory, which makes it difficult to justify a TA that at the moment is larger than the Royal Navy. A detailed analysis of the future operational requirement for the TA, which was conducted from the bottom up in exactly the same way as for the regular army, identified the need for a TA of about 40,000 strong. At the same time, SDR has confirmed that the TA still has a vital part to play, but the requirement is changing. The TA has to adapt to stay relevant. The aim of the SDR changes is to make the TA a more usable and more integrated part of the armed forces. Therefore, there'll be a shift of emphasis in the roles performed by the TA. What we need is a full range of roles to support a military deployment. Signalers, logisticians, artillery, air defence and particularly medical troops. We no longer need so many TA troops for the home defence of the UK. This is what is meant by making the TA relevant. Because of this, we can predict that infantry and RAC yeomanry regiments will be among those affected. A study is being carried out by Headquarters Land Command and no decisions on detailed structure and organisation have yet been made. A complete programme of consultation is taking place to address the TA's new structure and the results will be announced later this year. However, we are assured that every effort will be made to keep cap badges and maintain an even spread of TA centres across the country. What is certain is that the TA will have a more challenging role, capable of operating on a more regular basis in support of the government's foreign policy objectives. The Reserve Forces Act of 1996 allows for the wider use of the TA. SDR now confirms that the TA will be used, if need be, in situations short of a direct threat to the UK. Compulsory call-out could be invoked for some members of the TA, particularly those in medical units, in the event of a brigade-sized deployment. In this way, the TA will be smaller, yes, but well-balanced, better integrated with the regular army, and therefore more usable and relevant. The future TA is seen as essential to the Army's operational success. As for that other big rumour, no. The British Army isn't pulling out of Germany. We're staying there in the shape of one UK armoured div, with its three armoured brigades and with UK elements of Headquarters Arc and its Signals Brigade. But three armoured regiments with their support elements are withdrawing, in all some 2,500 troops over the next few years. So that's the story on SDR and how it affects the army. Our numbers are being cut, aren't they? No. Numbers are actually going up by some 3,300 regulars. And we're not pulling out of Germany, but we will have even more work to do with fewer resources. No, it's true we'll still have a lot to do. Our commitments aren't going to reduce, but we'll be better organised to meet these commitments into the new millennium. So the army is really back in business. As General Wilcox said, we must be properly structured and properly manned to meet our commitments. SDR has concentrated on those necessary structural changes. Once implemented, these changes will make people's lives easier. Overstretch will be reduced to the benefit of units, individuals and their families. I asked the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Roger Wheeler, to give us the last word on SDR. Sir, what effect will SDR have on the Army's operational capability? Our operational capability has at its very centre our membership of NATO, the war fighting capability. And therefore, although it's not been affected by the SDR, 
I'm very pleased that we have remained in the ARC, the Ace Rapid Reaction Corps, because that delivers our operational capability within NATO. But there are some elements of our organization which are unbalanced, and where we need to change things is to produce a better balance between those brigades that are stationed in Germany and those in Great Britain. And the sixth deployable brigade will do that. The second is that we lack a second line of communication to conduct our operations. Many individuals find themselves going back to Bosnia in the lines of communication business much more frequently than they should or than I would like. And the increase of three and a half thousand posts, the army is increasing in size, is to produce that second line of communication. And lastly, from the operational capability point of view, our airborne forces will amalgamate with our helicopter-borne attack helicopter forces to produce an air assault brigade, which will be a truly powerful organisation. What about individuals? Will soldiers and their families see a, an improvement in quality of life as a result of SDR? Well, they should do. The, the basis for the reasoning is one of operational capability, as I've described. It has been very much influenced by the need to try and achieve better stability, a more predictable way of life within the operational cycle that we have for soldiers and their families. And I hope very much that this is what will happen. What about the Territorial Army? What can members of the TA now look forward to? Well, I know a lot of people think that the TA is reducing and therefore there is nothing to look forward to. I would totally disagree with that. The TA was structured for our old operations. The new TA will be very much more relevant to our force projection business. And that means that they need to train on some areas that they haven't trained before. Tank crewmen, artillery crewmen and a variety of other skills that perhaps they have not trained for before because they haven't had the equipment. And that means we're going to need to have a much closer alignment with the regular army for training purposes than has been the case in the past. As you look forward, uh, look ahead to the army post-SDR, um, what are your priorities, would you say? Well, the first priority is to deal with the business of reorganisation, to do it as quickly as we can, but to make sure that we do not disrupt people any more than we absolutely have to to achieve this new balanced reorganisation which will have greater stability in the end. Secondly, we must continue to try to recruit the army fully. Undermanning is one of the worst aspects of instability at the moment. It causes people to have to backfill units when they go on operations. And we will continue to do our best to increase the manning within the army. And last, to make sure that we retain our operational capability because within all the turbulence that is bound to happen as a result of our reorganisation. We still have to be ready to meet whatever the role is that the country requires of us. And so throughout it all, as the Secretary of State has observed in his announcement about the SDR in Parliament, we have a very high reputation for our operational capability, and that we must maintain. Well, that's the word from the top man, General Sir Roger Wheeler. And that wraps up this special SDR edition of the Army Video Diary. We hope you've got the message that the Army is alive and well and a very important part of our nation's future. We'll be back in the autumn with the next Army Video Diary to show you what we've all been up to. See you then. Yes, see you in the autumn.